Well, first of all, it's an honor to be here tonight. Um, as Jim mentioned, I've been here for 22 years, and I've been inspired by all you here, what you've achieved, uh, the people that have been involved in the work here over, the, over that time. Um, has been a real inspiration and, and, uh, and an example for others that um, have been undertaking such Herculean tasks for such a long time. It's, it's just, um, you've done everything right. You know, we've done all these reports and you've followed all these reports to a T in the, in the, in the sequence they should be followed in and everything's worked out just wonderfully, but we're not there yet. You know, I'll talk about that. Well, Jim, first of all, your introduction was fantastic because you told, told everyone more about Christopher and, and Rebecca Gore um, way more than I could have, but, and, and it segues in nicely. Um, when I look at architecture, I look at the building and I try to find, I try to read the building and what is the building trying to tell me? And, um, and you know, how does the history of the building and the history of the people that lived within it and it has that tie with the fabric of the building itself and the design of the building itself. So I started doing a little bit of research. I wanted to um, share a little bit of that with you. Many of you already know this already. So and some of what I'm about to show you is uh, essentially a trip down memory lane. But um, I have a lot to cover tonight, so I'll, I'll just get into it. As Jim mentioned, uh, Rebecca Gore was very likely the real uh, impetus behind the design of the new house. So she started working with Legrand. Now I'm going to put my glasses on because I'm getting old. So I can see, see what I'm looking at here. Um, he, Legrand uh, was a pretty interesting character. And I was thinking to myself, why did she select uh, Legrand? First of all, he was a uh, brilliant architect. Uh, he was very well known in Paris. And the reason why he was well known in Paris, one of the reasons, is because he did this project. This is called the Hall of Blay. Uh, some of you may know it. It's it was essentially a donut-shaped building, and it was essentially a, also a, a grain uh, building. It's where grain was sold, and all it was is this giant um, loop or donut, um, but it didn't have any roof over its center. So uh, he got together by the fellow by the name of Molinos, and he designed and built this incredible dome. It was 180 feet across. And you can see this, and it had skylights in it. And it was a sensation at the time. People would travel to Paris just, just to see this building. And a person that saw this building, that was extremely interested in it, was none other than Thomas Jefferson. Uh, we perhaps we shouldn't be talking about Thomas Jefferson at Gore Place, but uh, I'm going to anyway. Uh, he was so excited by this that he met Legrand. Uh, he toured ser several of his houses. And later, uh, fast forward a number of years, all the way to uh, 1806, he worked with Benjamin Henry Latrobe uh, on the design of the new Capitol building. And in that building, he designed a whole new roof in the chambers. And of course, he was l using Legrand's ideas of how to span over the chambers. And he built these skylights uh, within the chamber. Um, Latrobe told him not to do this. He said it's going to leak like a sieve. It's not going to. It's not going to work. And sure enough, it leaked like a sieve, and it didn't work. <laughs> and uh, we, Latrobe was actually saved by um, the British when they burned the Capitol, and they, the ceiling went up. And <laughs> then he was able to. He was able to do what he wanted to there. But <clears throat> Legrand, um, you know, he traveled and looked at Roman ruins. <clears throat> But uh, he also, um, oh, first, first of all, I wanted to give a shout out to an architect by the name of Richard Chenoweth. He's, um, he did all these renderings, uh, a number of these renderings in the reconstruction. In case he was in the audience, I figured I should, I should say something. Uh, but Legrand uh, was an interesting guy because his father-in-law was a man by the name of um, Charles Louis Clarisseau. <clears throat> Charles Louis Clarisseau was also a sensation. He was considered to be the man. He, everyone in, uh, in Paris understood that he was the expert at looking at um, the Roman ruins of antiquity and understanding what they were. Clarisseau, you know, he's, he's called an artist, but the reality is he was really a great architect. And so this is sort of uh, running through uh, Paris at the time. And so Clarisseau uh, was connected to Legrand uh, by family, but also he was his teacher. And so Clarisseau, I just wanted to explore Clarisseau just for a few minutes. Uh, he, um, 
he would be painting Roman ruins, he would be drawing them, and he fell in love with it. You can tell he was just super passionate about what he was doing, and so, so much so that he hooked up with a fellow by the name of Piranesi. For those, so those of you who may have heard of Piranesi, and they traveled <coughs> uh, to Hadrian's Villa in Tivoli, um, and no one was doing this at the time. In fact, he went there and they were cutting out branches, they were burning them out, no one cared about this stuff. They were chasing away snakes and scorpions um, to, to record Hadrian's Villa. What's the importance of Hadrian's Villa? Well, if you look at it very carefully, <clears throat> you see all these little, they're almost like any who's ever been there, um, there's, there's all these little sort of experiences. They're all diff different, they're off axis, they're sort of colliding together. Um, but it's a really fantastic um, assembly of, of these experiences, architectural experiences, and they're all very, very different. And this actually will resonate later on in Clariso's career and others. So um, anyway, he, he starts to paint uh, Hadrian's Villa. And of course, Hadrian's Villa doesn't really look like that. It's almost like the Hudson River School painters where they make the, the Catskill Mountains look like the Rockies, you know. And the, <laughs> but. Uh, uh, he, he was still totally, totally um, enthralled by this. And one of the reasons why he was enthralled by this, I'm going to take a step back for a moment, because up to that time, most people thought of architecture as temples. They were following Andrea Palladio and his four books of architecture. Um, many of you, I'm sure, have heard of Palladio. But essentially, houses were made to look like temples, or they were, they were boxes, and they were assembled together to create these sort of tight little axes, and they were very, very orthogonal. Um, and, you know, here's a, here's a villa uh, that's right out of um, Il Quattro Libri, um, where the four books of architecture that uh, was authored by, by Palladio. So what Clariso was discovering was this was not what really Roman architecture is, the way people lived it was. It was something very, very different than that, including the art that was on its walls. So about that time, um, or a number of years before, uh, both Herculaneum and Pompeii were discovered. And these architects were making their way to, including Clariso and Legrand, by the way, <coughs> were exploring Pompeii and Herculaneum. They were actually seeing the wall paintings there. And uh, it's so much, it inspired um, uh, Clariso so much, he started, you know, he was an architect really at heart, and like most architects, they would start dreaming about dreamlike architecture. Started, he started painting sort of these imaginary scenes of, of sort of incredible overscaled architecture. And he started using the Pompeian wallpapers, or I'm sorry, wall paintings as, uh, as inspiration to create a whole new way of thinking uh, in terms of what the art and what a villa would have looked like. So he started creating these wonderful things, and he, he actually uh, got the attention, garnered the attention of um, Catherine the Great, believe it or not, <clears throat> and he designed a villa for her. Uh, this is an amazing, um, an amazing plan, but it's really based on what his findings uh, over at um, Hadrian's Villa, even though it's more orthogonal. In fact, um, she recognized this. She understood that uh, this was something out of Roman antiquity, but it was even beyond her purse, so it was never built. But what's really important about this is that if you notice, the rooms uh, aren't like Palladian rooms. They are a whole series of different experiences, different shapes, different sizes, sort of colliding together um, in, in a way that was ex experienced and uh, understood by him after visiting uh, Hadrian's villa. So this was starting to get him thinking clearly in a different way than what the architecture of antiquity uh, was in reality. And even the wallpapers, uh, the wall paintings, were um, inspired by the wall paintings over at, at uh, Pompeii. So he started to spread the word of this, and this really swept through Paris, uh, not only through Le Grand, but many other architects were taking this on and developing a whole new type of classicism. Um, and it became um, really the architectural center of the planet, at least in the, in the Western world. Uh, these plates, um, uh, were, are from a book that I have right over here. By the way, I brought in a couple of books, and if you can keep your wine away from it, you're welcome to uh, thumb through them, and I'll get to those in, in a minute. But uh, 
they, uh, they really have recorded all the major Parisian buildings and uh, villas of the time over a period of about 15 years. And uh, these are just a, a fantastic uh, uh, way to understand what 18th, or late 18th century Paris houses really look like. And um, by the way, I, I looked closely at these as I looked at uh, here at Gore Place. Another amazing uh, kind of connection is that uh, Clarisseau was retained by Robert and James Adam, uh, so they came over individually to take the grand tour and to learn under uh, Clarisseau. So where they went, uh, they went to Split or Spolito, uh, Diocletian's palace, and here in, in working with Clarisseau, they laid out the entire floor plan of that. Uh, but once again, what you're seeing in details are all these sort of little experiences, all these little poche spaces, what we call poche spaces, when things kind of collide together. You see that black, all that black? Uh, that's just tr trying to resolve what happens when you design a building with all these different shapes and, and they come together. So um, they worked with, uh, actually, um, Robert and James Adam started a whole new movement in England. They published a book also with Clarisseau, uh, as several books, and uh, one was a pattern book of all their new designs, once again inspired by what they're seeing in Split or Spolito. And this is Cyan House, for example. Uh, you start to see this whole new kind of architecture sweeping across, it's already swept across uh, France, and now it's sweeping into England. And that's making its way eventually here to the United States, which we call the, the federal period, or the Adamesque movement. And it's, it's really from uh, these two gentlemen that were inspired and worked with Clarisseau, Legrand's father-in-law. And they believed in this holistic architecture. Even, there's a plate off to the side here where they're, they're designing everything, light fixtures, mirrors, uh, you know, uh, side tables, urns, everything. Everything they saw, everything they touched, it was sort of this holistic way of thinking. Uh, and they d developed these just incredible um, designs for, for, for wall art that once again was, was very much experienced by um, Herculaneum and, uh, and Pompeii.